Lovely. <clears throat> and thank you all. And I'm, uh, I really do encourage you, if you have questions or comments, we need to get you to a microphone, because there's people listening at home, and they're hanging blah, 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 blah. So we, want, we don't want your thoughts to be lost into the room. So I know it's a long haul, but get yourself there. Get thee to a microphone. I think that's Shakespeare. Um, so this, the, now the formal panel has tackled this map, we get to go to the next complexity because we are, the, I don't know what we are. Um, this, this panel is essentially talking about the uh, societal and community benefits, the both first order and second order. So I wanted to actually have up here illustration three, which sort of explodes parts of the map uh, into pieces. Um, and so you'll see here what was one box is now benefit of art to society and communities and direct and indirect economic benefits. So economics was bundled into that one box now. It's broken out here. And I think Jimena was mentioning the arrow has actually changed in interesting ways. Uh, and then the sort of the, the second order benefits to society is now in three boxes, which you saw in Sunil's conversation a little bit. Um, capacity to innovate and express ideas, outlets for creative expression, new forms of self-expression. Um, so our goal here with our great team, who I will introduce, we have David Freyer, Executive Director of Arts Midwest, over here. We have Roland Kushner, Associate Professor of Muhlenberg College, to my right, and Kathy Dwyer Southern, who's the founding president and CEO of the National Children's Museum, which is opening very soon. Um, and I think they essentially own the map, I'm pretty sure. <laughs> they, might, they might copyright or trademark it. So I thought first, just to get your first resonance or feedback, another test I like to use in maps or, or symbols is, does it resonate with you? Is there a dissonance or does this leave you cold? Um, so what, where are we on the resonance, dissonance, or nothing's in it? I made that up, it's pretty good. Kathy, you wanna start? <laughs> um, well, for me, uh, I find the, uh, the map a very interesting and important moment in time. And I um, wanna actually take this moment to be an advocate for the fact of what has happened here today, bless you, AU, and uh, Rocco and Joan. It, this is really mm -hmm. an extraordinary moment in time for all of us who have worked in the field, some of you younger than some of us, um, but all of us together, uh, we've spent a lot of time all going our own way. It's a deep, fundamental quality of what it is to be an artist, and, and that's, that's really important. But in terms of research, and to be able to talk about things like value and impact, to have us each do our work individually, and by each of us, now, I now speak as a museum director, having served on several national association boards. Um, this is a fabulous opportunity. You have laid out a, uh, a map that is holistic. It, we can pick it apart, and I promise you, Rocco, we will, because that's what we do. <laughs> but then, once, we, once we're done doing that, the opportunity for all of us is really to, I think, play in. We can find ourselves as individuals, as a museum director, I can, I can see where I fit. I can, I can work out the work that we're doing at the National Children's Museum. And then, of course, as individuals, um, as individuals and researchers, uh, that's a, a, a second really important piece. Secondly, what this opportunity provides, and again, NEA's leadership here, is the interagency work. And again, I, um, we all remember days, Andrew, we, the four of us remember days where the agency um, saw itself as a very separate, special place. And it was separate, and it was special, and it was alone, and, um, and reflected how society regarded the broader field. It was really a reflection back and forth uh, between the agency. That's a kind of leadership, I guess, but not one that I found especially uh, valuable. So the notion that you are involving other agencies and that you've reached out to the field, um, both our own field, but then related fields, and I thought the very good questions earlier around science, can you put religion in here? Can you put cooking in there? <laughs> you know, what else can we put in here? That this is a, it's a, um, uh, it's a, a system, it's a, you know, it's a map to be used in the ways that make sense. That you've reached outside the field, I think, is really, um, is really extraordinarily, extraordinary. And then finally, um, I think the whole notion of negative capability, which I didn't know that word before, but I'm going to use it now every day. <laughs> that, that we, as a field, have immense negative capability. That is, we, we that's a misuse of it, that we, we have debated a set of issues in this field for many, many years, popular art versus, uh, versus high art, um, are you an artist or not? Those are important debates. I don't mean in any way to not recognize them for what they are. But to have a system that allows us to set those conversations aside in terms of a research agenda, I think is really an extraordinary, important step 
for us because it lets us get on with the work about the rest of society who still wonders what the hell we do. So I think this, this is a great moment in time, Andrew, for us to do it and for us to move forward. And I hope people sign on. If you have to hold your nose a little bit, hold your nose. If you have to poke at it, poke at it. But then sign on. Figure out how you, figure out how you fit in. And, I, and back to you guys at the endowment, you've presented this in the proper way, which is to say this is NEA's research agenda. But I hope you advocate um, to the other organizations and researchers like, um, like some, of the, some of the folks with me right here who are doing work, advocate to them. To, to sign on. This is an opportunity that the whole will be much better, bigger than the sum of its parts. Thanks, Kathy. And David, did you have similar or different? Uh, somewhat similar and somewhat different, both, I think. Uh, again, first of all, uh, I think I, I join with my colleagues and just say my read of this uh, over the last few days as I've been studying the, the map and reading the report has been really favorable. Uh, and it's been favorable mostly, I think, from the standpoint of saying, wow, at last. Uh, there is a sense of a whole, a sense of, of, of kind of unity to understanding a, a sort of research agenda, which is really critical and important for the field. Uh, not to denigrate any of the research that any of us have done or the endowment has done in the past whatsoever, but rather to say, uh, I think a lot of it has been ad hoc. Uh, it's been, okay, here's an opportunity to study this thing. Here's where we have data that we can look at X or Y, or we can build from what we know. Uh, but the opportunity now instead to look at a map, say these are how the pieces fit together, uh, and here are the holes, here's where we're strong already, uh, that to me gave me hope. Uh, secondly, uh, I'm, I'm not a wonk. Uh, I'm, I'm probably, you know, kind of a, I, I'm someone who likes to take what wonks do and then apply them. So a wink. I think that's yeah, right. I'm a wink. <laughs> I'm not going to go with any more of this, okay? Stop it right here. Uh, but uh, for me, it's what happens next. So where I got really excited about looking at this, looking at both the research agenda, looking at the map, I was kind of coming at it from the standpoint of, okay, let's say we start to fill these holes. Let's say we really start to build a comprehensive uh, package of data and research, et cetera. What do we do with it next? And that's the piece that I'm kind of intrigued by. What, it's like the next document to me. It's like, how do we take this and this in its, in its fulfillment and move to policy, to practice, to communication, to advocacy? And how do we do that? So we're, we're also then, the iteration of the, that is to say, we're building a story here about this field. Uh, it's our story. We then, and this goes, goes back to uh, some conversations where I was having last week, is that we, we need to know that we're not telling our story uh, the way we want to tell it, but that we're also taking all of this and understanding how we tell a story that people really want to hear. Yeah. You know, it's not like, hey, it's good for you, drink it. Right. You know, it's, this, is, this is not the point. <laughs> no. Uh, so uh, I think that I get really excited about all of this. My biggest question on, on the map itself is the floating godlike moment at the top of human impulse to create and express, which I definitely agree with, but I also wonder why there's no loop into it. Uh, is it absolutely sacrosanct? Is it isolated from all of these influencers and, and uh, the, the multipliers and everything else? Does it exist solely on its own in perpetuity, or can we destroy it? Or can we enhance it? Uh, how does that operate? So I'm just wondering if there isn't some loop that doesn't, at some point, link back in there. Uh, because I, think it, I don't think it exists solely on its own. So that's just a, a yeah. philosophical question that we'll throw out to all the aesthetics folks. Yes, well, no, David, David's applying the Big Bang Theory to the map, which right. I like it. That's right. right. <laughs> Boom. That is absolutely my favorite part of this map I just have to share. Human impulse has to make a little jump 
to get into the system. Did you see that? Yeah. It has a little leap. It has to jump over the boundary of the system, otherwise it trips. So there's a little tiny bump there. It's jumping over that line. And I think that's, I could spend like, a, I could do a dissertation on that little jump. Um, it's, it's, and it's, it's actually is outside the, right. Yeah, no, yeah, right. It's, it's, and we know it's you could. That bad idea. I think it's great. I'm going to get, get tenure so well. Um, but the, yeah, the idea that human impulse lives outside the system, it is somehow not connected in any way. And in fact, it has to jump its way in. Um, is just really intriguing to me. But um, go ahead. Roland, could you share what your perspectives were on this? Sure. Uh, uh, first, uh, thanks to American and to the endowment. Congratulations to Sunil and Tony for uh, uh, for what you did. Uh, uh, I love systems maps, uh, and I've, I've used them at various times in my own research. And uh, uh, part of what I do is uh, a national level, national and annual level measurement of uh, of the arts with. Uh, uh, the, uh, the National Arts Index uh, project, and we base that, uh, Randy Cohen's my co-author, we base that in a, um, a systems model. Uh, we, we very explicitly wanted to say uh, uh, that the arts have capacity, there's participation in the arts, that the arts have competitiveness, and the first one, though I'll mention, I'm mentioning it at the end, is that the arts are financed. And this gets me to an issue that I'm thinking might not have been, uh, uh, might be underrepresented in, in, in the systems, the systems uh, uh, map. Um, you know, I think there's, there's some, uh, it has such a great scope and it has so many different elements in it. And, and yet I'm, I'm thinking of things that, to the extent that this systems map is the basis for a research agenda, that it's supposed to set a plan for how the endowment's going to allocate resources and how it's going to uh, uh, attract researchers from, uh, from the private sector and government. Uh, uh, a, a question that I, I think uh, hasn't been addressed, and, and I think it's part of the ongoing process that the, that the uh, endowment is doing, is who are the audiences for these pieces of research? What kinds of impacts, what kinds of change are the research products themselves supposed to accomplish? Mm -hmm. Everybody in the room is comfortable and familiar with them, but we're the wrong people, right? It, it, it should be appealing to, it should be meaningful to more than the communities who are represented here. What's, what's the, 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 the larger societal impact, <clears throat> not of the arts, but of the research on the arts that, the, that this is supposed to be an agenda for? So I think about that and uh, uh, I was also struck by the relative absence of dollars in the, uh, uh, in, in the systems map, because if these effects are flowing one way and uh, it's a recursive system, what's flowing the other way? And all of the different impacts, values, benefits, worthy consequences that are, are there, how are they being created uh, uh, from the human spirit, from the, uh, for, from the earth? So, so uh, uh, that was part of my, of my uh, uh, reading of it, was uh, uh, how do you get the best value out of the map itself? Uh, and, and, and some of my colleagues here on the panel have, uh, have, have mentioned that. I also wish that it said more about aesthetics, because it says expression, and it says uh, 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 that, that we're going to change lives, and we're going to have these impacts, and we're going to liberate the human spirit, but where's the place of beauty? Whether it's perceived by the beholder or the artist, I'd sure like to see it somewhere in there, you know, to know that it is the arts and rather than, rather than just uh, uh, ex ex expression. Um, and then uh, what, uh, what the, the model describes, what the, the map describes as multipliers, these uh, external forces that affect the arts, I'm wondering if some of them aren't occasionally dividers as well. The implication of multipliers is that they have a value greater than one. Therefore, if you put some, if you put some arts in and you attach it to a multiplier, all of a sudden it grows and it has a bigger <laughs> impact on society. Well, what, if, what, if, uh, what if those are negative forces? What if those are negative and reducing forces? Economics being one, and, and look, there's, there's two different scenarios for how the political season will end up, and one of them could be a multiplier for the arts, but one of them certainly could be a... <laughs> A, uh, a, a compressor, and, and, and so to think about that political dimension and then to apply the same kind of thinking to the other multipliers as you've expressed them. So those, yeah, uh, you know, I have some, some, uh, some other things, but those were some of the, some of the, uh, the issues that I have. But I, but I go back to the first thing, to have a systematic 
uh, a way of approaching how uh, the arts are created, uh, even though there's the, you know, even with a little jump <laughs> that, that Andrew said, and how, the, how their, their benefits, their consequences, their results, their impacts all flow outward, and how you've systematized that is, is, is more than admirable. It's, it's, it's tremendous. Yeah. Thanks, Roland. Um, so I know, I mean, I love the way Anne and the former panel were talking about the bubbles and what's in the bubbles and where you experience those bubbles. I want to focus on the arrows, because the part of systems that always get me are not, I mean, there's stocks and flows. Those are the words we use. Stocks sort of hold things and contain things like a bathtub. Flows get them from one stock to another. It sort of flows. Um, so there's a whole lot going on in all those, every one of those arrows. Um, it's sort of like the black box. Um, so I wanted to talk to our, our, our panelists a little bit because each of you essentially does work to create, I mean, to, to build off the energy of that um, yellow sun in the middle and to actually generate um, or discuss about the, the value of those arrows and how they connect. So David, maybe uh, first with you, clearly through Arts Midwest, you're representing a lot of state agencies, but also artists and arts organizations. They're trying to argue to their uh, constituents and make sure that everyone knows um, the values that are flowing from the experience they create. So are there specific examples or sort of uh, reflecting points that you can talk about where you saw an arrow like that, where the way you talk about it, or maybe you could talk a little bit about how that, um, how that flows? No. Okay. <laughs> no, just, just. So Kathy, I think we're gonna take a shot. Just kidding. I mean, I've got to give the guy a little trouble because That's he right. did leave our region, let's face it. <laughs> uh, 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 well, we are talking here about benefit of art to society and communities, and I've, I've got two or three points, uh, examples, thinking about that. So I read that I, uh, came back to me that we're really telling and one that actually popped up, actually, in, in response to Tony uh, early on, who was mentioning the uh, Emily Dickinson uh, and the notion of sitting in this room and you know, writing these, these great pieces. And you were talking about kind of the accretive power of, of, of arts experience or arts activity, which actually triggered for me uh, a, a big read project that we've worked on and with and on behalf of the National Endowment for the Arts in Tucson uh, last year, uh, where a, a local organization in Tucson uh, focused its big read activity on reading the works of Emily Dickinson uh, community-wide. And they did it actually deliberately in response to the shootings that took place in Tucson, uh, and the shootings that included the shootings of, of Gabby Giffords. Uh, and they were using the process and the program uh, as a healing project, uh, trying to bring people together around this moment of beauty and peace, uh, utilizing the poems for what they were, but also utilizing the experience in restaurants, in bars, literally, in an array of clubs. Uh, so they were building this thing out and, in fact, had this amazing experience community-wide uh, where the community was able to come together around something much more beautiful. Uh, than, than a violent act. Uh, on a very different plane, uh, I would look at a project that we're engaged with right now, which hap happily uh, we were just renewed for support on, a project called Caravanserai, uh, which we've been working with the Doris Duke Foundation for Islamic Arts on, uh, which is an effort to introduce into smaller and mid-sized American communities a different understanding of Islamic society and Islamic culture and values through the arts. Uh, so we're in communities such as Helena, Montana, uh, Fayetteville, Arkansas, Jamestown, North Dakota, uh, tiny little communities and mid-sized communities across America with contemporary artists from Pakistan, from Morocco, uh, and we're having a dialogue, and a, com a, a community-wide dialogue about what does it mean to be from Pakistan? Who are you? What is your community like? What are, what is, what, why, are, why do I not understand you? Why do I not know about you? And we're opening up this conversation. And again, are there, coming back to the point that was raised in the earlier panel, I think you're absolutely right that the line between benefit of art to individuals and benefit of art to societies and communities is very permeable. Uh, those bubbles are not, are not isolated. Uh, but we can, we can definitely look, and we're tracking through research that we're doing with Alan Brown, 
uh, we are doing a, a kind of a deep dive uh, through caravanserai into how the experience of interacting with these artists is changing attitudes. So we're doing kind of a longitudinal study throughout the course of a year with a group of people uh, in these communities to say, what were your attitudes going in? How are you changing? What are you looking at? Uh, we're tracking such things as curiosity. Uh, because for me, curiosity is a big trigger, uh, both on an individual level but on a community level. How curious is this community about wanting to know more about another society? That means that there's more openness. There's more engagement. So we're looking at that. And I think, that to me, that's a, that's a good place of saying, yeah, it would fit in here. And the research we're doing with Alan Brown would definitely fit in here. It's not macro stuff, but it's data that, would, that I think that would be really useful in this, in this dialogue. That's great. Thanks. And, and Kathy, um, you've been working really hard in the First National Children's Museum for the United States. And I adore what they say on their website and their mission, inspiring children to care about and improve the world. So essentially, you're designing a museum experience to inspire empathy and action. So essentially, you are the arrow. Um, so, so tell me how that arrow works. How does it work in, in the way you're conceiving of the museum? We, we, it's not, nothing like working on a small project. You that's know, right. That's what we all like in this, in this room. Um, I want to pick up on, in answer to Andrew's question, some of the themes that David has just touched on because they've been very true for us. First, the positioning for us um, is to start with the visitor, that is the kid, and their impulse. So we start there, we start, we start, with, the, we start with the globe, but we start with the visitor, and that's an anathema for many artists who don't start with the participa participant, but rather with their own creative juices. For us, we start with the issues of curiosity and creativity with the kid, and we think that is the, the appropriate starting point. So in terms of building the museum, the first bit of work we did over three or four years was research in terms of asking kids what they expected in a National Children's Museum. You know, guess what? They have different opinions than we do. Mm -hmm. what, what, one of the things I can promise every single one of you this is an insight I have about all of you in this room. I know this absolutely. It's a deep, dark secret. You once were a child. <laughs> okay, so you started out there. <laughs> um, and those impulses, you, you hung on to them somehow. You're sitting in this room. You are about the arts. That's why, why you're here. Your notions of creativity, um, curiosity, are in hand. But somehow, for some kids, those get wiped away, get eliminated. So what is the role of a children's museum? What is the role of a museum? What is the role of the cultural community in terms of kids having places where that's inspired, um, where, that, where we're, where we're a, a place where their creativity really, really develops? So we thought it was important to start first by asking them what, um, what they expected in a children's museum. And we did this in a number of ways with some research institutes. Time Magazine, Time for Kids was our participant for a period of time. We uh, put five questions up, eight questions up on their website that they helped us develop. It crashed the site because so many kids responded because nobody asked kids, you're just, you're just a kid. You know, <laughs> so, so they had the opportunity to respond. And, and their responses has driven the core and was at the center of how that mission statement Andrew came to fruition to inspire kids to care about and improve the world. They said things like, I want it to be about some serious stuff, not just making cookies. I want it to be about things that matter in the world. I want to be, a kid wouldn't use the word empowered, but I want to be part of stuff. I want to be able to do stuff. And, and, and I don't know how to do it. I'm 10, I got a bike. How do I get involved is, are some of the things that you can place yourself back, you know, you got a bike. Or, uh, the internet's there, there are many new ways. But that, that framed for us by starting with the visitor, uh, the visitor of the work. The big themes of the museum, and this is the second piece that David Hughes just touched on, and, and it, it is the National Endowment for the Arts, so that is why that word is there. But what you've just been talking about, and our big, big themes, cross into the sciences 
um, and culture in a broader way. And that, that is true for museums. That's one of the gifts of museums and one of the issues for museums that is that as a field, we represent the arts and culture, a broader, uh, a broader mix. That doesn't denigrate any one piece, but it means our big themes, which also came out of our visitors, what their expectations were, what did they value, and for us, then that led to what, what kinds of impact could we have if we think the visitors want these. So the themes which start with the arts, but then include, uh, include the environment. Kids care about that a lot. Civic engagement, which is, boy, if it's topical ever, it's here we are today. But that needs to be true all the time in terms of our work. Um, the environment, and then, and then back to your earlier comments uh, um, on the world cultures, that, that kids today deal in an in a international setting if they go to school pretty much, for many kids, not everyone, but for many kids. So those big themes also came out of our, out of, also came out of our, our, our research. What does it mean in terms of application? The um, inspiring kids is a classic museum activity. So we, pre we feel pretty confident about how to do that. There are museums across the country that do that very well. For children's museums, it can't be don't touch. So, so for instance, uh, in our town, which is part of the museum, which will be opening soon, and your local community open in December, um, uh, in our town, you can put out a fire hey, that's pretty good, you know, you don't get to do that every day. Uh, you can run for office, uh, and that's something we should all practice at, because we need you to run for office out there, let's, <laughs> let's get involved. Um, uh, um, uh, y y the cultural exchange piece really lets you walk in the shoes of others. So it has to be par participatory, that's a fundamental piece for children's museum. But then the question is, what difference does it make? Is there value? How do we, how do we measure value? How do we know the kid after they've been there once, or they've been there 20 times? What difference does it make? So the notion of putting the feedback loop in, of telling us what, telling us what this can happen through membership, obviously these are now all te technological ways that can be part of a museum experience or performing arts experience, is um, uh, tell, us, tell us what you did as a result of this experience. And as we started looking at this, we thought, well, okay, we're projecting about 400,000 visitors annually. If we get 5%, that's still a big number of kids who are making a difference in their community. And then that fundamental question that we heard from kids, of how do I get involved? One of the best ways is to have an example. What's David doing? He's riding his bikes off to, you know, to give to the food bank or whatever. There are so many wonderful ways to involve in society individually and also through groups. So some of it's as simple as, a, uh, as access. But what's important about it, it's the kid demonstrating to another kid. Adults are welcome, but they're not the driving force. So the tracking mechanisms and feedback loop are really gonna be important to us also, Andrew, and will roll out over the next couple of years. We thought the value of starting, we've had 30 years of working in this community, but of starting with a new facility was to kind of start fresh with putting in some of those basic elements as a part of it. Oh, that's great. I know a lot of children's museums now have adult-only nights, so I wanna come um, <laughs> when none of the kids can see what I'm gonna play with and have yeah. fun with. Then I can, You're welcome. Yes, You're that'd welcome. be great. Um, so Roland, I guess um, I'm coming back, and you talked a little bit about the Arts Index, but so we can talk about our impressions and our stories and our narratives. Somewhere in here, it would be great to attach to either numbers or observations or research. Um, what are some of the ways that you've seen both the arts and maybe other, uh, other areas of um, society connect research to the kind of things we're talking about here? Well, a couple, a couple of things. First, just thinking of the, of the anecdotes that, uh, that David and Kathy shared. I'm thinking of uh, where I live in Bethlehem, Pennsylvania. The arts have really had a, a transformative effect on how the community recovered. This is a multi-decade story. It's not only recently. Mm -hmm. from, uh, from the demise of the steel industry and, and uh, uh, to the extent that uh, uh, there's a, uh, a significant performing arts center that sits right beside the blast furnaces of Bethlehem Steel, which have, it has architectural lighting on it, and there's a glass wall that's the backdrop to the stage. So you're seeing these, these uh, uh, early 20th century, 100-foot industrial behemoths while you're listening to whoever you're listening to. Now, that's just, that's just a matter of the infrastructure, but the organization that has developed it, uh, um, uh, called Arts Quest, it really has had a transformative effect on the community, on its reputation, on uh, 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 on civil society in the uh, uh, in the community. As to your question, Andrew, as to how this works elsewhere, uh, uh, in, in in other sectors, businesses are always looking for 
creatively trained, they, I hope they are, I believe they are, <laughs> looking for creatively trained, innovatively skilled uh, 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 recruits. And, and, and again, here in the room, we know that, that arts training is a significant contributor, uh, contributor to that. In terms of, of, of the measurement of the arts, I think that a, 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 an important level of analysis question is, are we trying to measure the whole country? And what are the consequences of that? Or alternatively, are we trying to measure the arts where people enjoy them, which is almost entirely in their communities? The arts are so, so much more a local phenomenon than, than a national one. Of course there's national media, of course there is recorded media, there's iTunes and all of the different ways that, that we can all share in the same artistic product, but where the art is produced, it's produced in a place. And, and, and so to the extent that, that, going back to what I'd said earlier about how this works as, as an agenda for you, that you think about how it works in communities, of course you're doing many of those things as well with the, the new growth uh, and economic theory and with the Our Town and, and so many of the different programs that, that you have going. I think that's a, that's a real strength of, uh, uh, of what this, uh, what this uh, can do. Um, and it also makes me think of the question, as, as we sat down, someone in the audience said, how does this work internationally? How does this work in, in other countries? It works the same. If this is a good systems map, and I think it is, if this is a good model of how uh, the creative impulse extends out over society, then it's not unique to what we do here but the values attached to different arrows might be different in different places. So the same mapping process is going on, I believe, but here, here in the U.S., I think we, we, we recognize that there's been a broader public policy interest in what the economic consequences of the arts are, and so that arrow has, gets more attention here. In other parts of the world, the arrow's still there, but they don't care as much because they get other intrinsic values out of it and, and they are sufficient for the policy side. Uh, 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 so so I, you know, I see that, that, that the, the attention that, that you can use to, uh, to look at, at what goes on locally in particular, I think is, is, a, is a strength uh, of, um, uh, of how the arrows work, as you said, because that was your initial question. It's not just the nodes, but the, not just the stocks, but the flows as well. Yeah. Thanks. Um, and I think what we're going to do is flow into public comments. And if you're <laughs> online, I'm, I am following the Twitter feed here. So um, send me a question or a comment. Uh, I think I want to turn our focus just a little bit. And I'm going to give you a preview of what I'm going to ask you to do toward the end if you're willing to stand up. Um, I'm curious about what comes next. So you've, you've heard enough about this to think about what might come after you see this and other people see it. And not just that, but what would you in your work or your uh, activity or in your commitment, what are you going to bring to it? So if there's a conversation that comes next here, what does it look like? Who is it among? What are you going to do personally or with your organization to bring it forward? I'd love to hear those sort of things. I'm starting to hear people get up. So go ahead and say whatever you're going to say before I primed a different question. <laughs> <laughs> oh, okay, I'm, I'm going to respond to your question. Okay, actually. go That's then. That's exactly what I wanted to say. I'm, I'm Marjorie McGurk, and I want to congratulate the NEA and the Monitor Group for putting together such a wonderful systems map, and especially for selecting Asheville, North Carolina as one of your cities <laughs> to hold your seminar. Very proud of that. Um, I'm struck by some of the comments about science that came up earlier, that science could be the yellow sun, um, that science is a, uh, that art is a form of research that increases knowledge of society. But I'm also struck by the difference between what I view, the uh, difference between science and um, art. I think there are a lot of artists here. Raise your hand if you're an artist. Everybody. Yeah. So speaking as a token uh, scientist in the room, <laughs> you know, art, art is, um, uh, has ambiguity. Art raises questions. Science tries to come to its truth. Science tries to be devoid of emotion. Science tries to, a good science write, writing at its best has no gender, has no questions, has answers, has no personality, has no uh, advocacy, most important in art. In, many ways to me at least, seems to be quite the opposite. That gives art the power of the ability to change human thinking, human behavior in the course of, of humanity. And I was wondering, with that in mind, no pressure on the artist, how do you see how art can um, work with scientists to help us understand our world 
and move forward with all the kinds of problems and solutions that we need to evolve? That's a great question. Mm -hmm. Because, because we don't have to use uh, the, the whole process of breaking established scientific paradigms as a creative process. Uh, more so, if we use science to describe art a little more, we know that for humans to extract memory from their brains, memory is associated with emotions. If you really want someone to think and act, you have to deal with their emotions. Science doesn't deal with emotions, it's facts. It tries to put forward facts in a non-emotional way. But it's the artist that can take facts and figures and science and information, what you're doing at the Children's Museum, you're presenting the world in a way in which they can act. If you want people to move forward on any ideas, emotional context, waves of things that we've done in our country, um, it's been through the art. It's, yeah, some, of the, some of the most, it's an excellent question, some of the most interesting work I think always is at, is at the boundaries, is at borders, whether it's international boundaries or borders, or whether it's fields, <laughs> boundaries or borders, the, the baskets that we divide society into. And, and one of the things that we've discovered, certainly working with kids, but that's true for all of us here as well, is that, is that these things do smush together, and that where the, where the real vitality comes from, for me at least, is the rub, is where, where one crosses over to the other, or where I might debate with you a bit about the uh, l lack of emotion around science. I mean, the landing of the uh, Mars uh, rover, I saw a room full of passionate, screaming engineers and scientists. They did not look not, <laughs> not deeply emotionally involved. So, and I realize that's not quite the, exa uh, the, the saying that you're talking about. But I think we can learn from each other in those fields. And pushing in on those boundaries, we find kids don't see the boundaries. They don't start out there. We teach them the boundaries, but they don't start out there. And I think it'd be worth, the, the NEA itself is doing such extraordinary new work with um, veterans, with, uh, with health and wellness, and creating science at the intersection. So actually doing neuroscience and brain scanning on people who have experienced expressive work, and is it resolving some of the issues? So there's this, I think the common ground between the science and the art is where these things will happen first, and it's great, and I've seen these at local levels, uh, and maybe Joan will talk about some as well. Um, talk over here first, then we'll go back here. Um, I'd like to respond to Roland's comment that art is local. Um, it, may, it just isn't true in America that the vast majority of the time we spend appreciating art is cable television and theatrical movies and stuff that everybody has the same stuff. Even uh, people who are very passionately involved in arts might see plays once a week, but they'll watch TV for hours a day. But they're playing guitar in their own houses and with their own friends. And they're reading and writing and painting in their communities. So there, so it, there, there is a, there's a national message, uh, there's a national content to be sure, and even a global one. Uh, 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 and, and there's a superstar phenomenon that we know that the, that the, the, the large, the, the, the best publicized works get the national attention. That's the economies of scale. But there is so much that goes on at the local level. Local businesses in the arts, uh, uh, local competitions and, and educational programs for students, they don't all follow a national pattern. So it, it's not an either or, but, uh, but uh, uh, I think it's critical to, to recognize how vital the arts at the community are, even while from a macroeconomic standpoint, which Rachel, I know is your, is your interest, we recognize the impact that it has on the economy uh, at the macro level. That's great. Over here, Joan. Uh, hi, I'm Joan Jeffrey. I'd like to pull back a little bit to what Sunil was saying earlier about this extraordinary partnership that the NEA has forged with so many other agencies, NIH, NIA, and so forth. And I think, and, and maybe give the NEA a little homework. Um, now that the research division at NEA and research is evidenced as, as a real place of seriousness and rigor, yes. uh, I think the perception by some, I'm interested in the panel's reaction, is that um, the NEA is a little data heavy, especially with big data sets. And I, I'm fully aware that you need data to make policy. Um, and my hope is that the NEA can help to convince some of these partner agencies that uh, heavy data sets don't always portray the arts or artists accurately. 
um, that everything isn't a randomized clinical trial, that that isn't always the right answer, and it isn't always appropriate. And I think we need, in a sense, a joint education of those agencies on um, how to think about researching collaboratively to make this positive. And the other thing, and I know Sunil must be thinking about this, is how do we use these agencies to change the census and other government surveys to reflect our reality, which is not less, it's different. Comments or responses? Right here, Sunil. Yes, <laughs> yes. <laughs> thank you, Joan. Go ahead. Yeah. Hi. Uh, I would first like to comment on um, the sad lack of art used in displaying how art works, which <laughs> sort of made me sad in a way. Um, but speaking to the arrows, which is also my interest, uh, I'm a, at a slight disadvantage as I just got this, and so I didn't get a chance to look at this for a long while. But I would propose the notion of eliminating the arrows altogether, um, because as a map, right now you're providing us with directions, which as a blank map, it shouldn't do. So I'd rather have instead a compass that directs us perhaps where we might want to put the arrows, but then we can put them ourselves. Very nice. All right, there's Very a nice. kit. I like this. Yeah. Yes. <laughs> Thank you. That's participatory. Russell? That's good. <laughs> are you just stretching or are you going to say? No, I'm. I'm <laughs> Uh, Russell Taylor, no relation, as Andrew is always very yes, quick please. to say. You will always um, say that. Yeah. <laughs> it's not true. <laughs> this is really, I mean, first of all, thank you. This is all very interesting. Um, and there's a lot of, of uh, really useful information, I think, that's being gathered and, and not before time. Several people on the panel have commented on the value, you know, making sure that we know what the utility of the information is. And I think that's terribly important because um, I suppose if, if I could uh, query the NEA on anything, it would be, do you plan for every dollar you spend on this, which I think is a dollar well spent, <laughs> to spend a dime telling people you've got it and how they might find it useful? Because I think, you know, we, we have a lot of reports, and this is new ground, I'm not suggesting that it's not. We have a lot of reports that have a high thud factor that gather dust and, you know, and, and, and. Um, or virtual dust, I guess we would say now. Um, but it's really, really important for people to know where this is, how it can be used, how it can be interpreted. Otherwise, a huge amount of work goes into uh, this kind of research that is literally wasted, but more discouragingly, advances that could be made aren't made. And so um, I think this is all terrific. Personally, I think it looks like an egg. Um, and I'm really happy with that. Um, <laughs> and uh, you kind of have to have arrows in a systems map. It's, it's not really optional. It's not a map in that way. But, um, uh, but I, I think this is tremendously useful. And you need to tell people why and how it is useful, if you don't mind my making that suggestion. Thanks, Russell. R could I, could yeah, I just add to Russell to your comment, which is I think, yes, we should put it back on the endowment. But as Pogo said many years ago, we, we've uh, identified the en enemy, and it is us. So I think we have, a, we have responsibility here, too, um, as researchers, as institutions, to share in the conversations around this, as opposed to it only being the endowment's role. And I, don't, I know you agree with me, and now you're away from the mic. You have to agree with me, so. <laughs> uh, you can go back. Go back and agree. Roland? Roland, did you have a response? I, 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 I do. Uh, over the course of the afternoon, the issue of the value of the arts has, has yeah. come up now. You know, so we can discuss that in philosophical terms. But thinking about the, the, the multipliers, uh, uh, one of the multipliers is the competitive environment. Are people choosing the arts over what else they, uh, they could do? Uh, in a few hours, there's going to be a football game on. Are people going to the theater? Or are they going to watch the ball game? That's a competitive choice. That's their, that's their valuation of their time, what they're going to do with it. And uh, uh, I, uh, just, just speaking to the last point that was made, if, if to promote the arts and help achieve the, both the endowment's larger objectives and the, and the research, the, the, uh, the Office of Research's uh, objectives, that point about uh, why is it important that we know the answers to the questions that are that are implicit there? Uh, and you, you have to you have to sell that along with 
the art itself. Uh, so I, I really applaud the, uh, the, the, the who asked the, the question. I'm sorry, I don't know your name. Uh, uh, but but that's I think a, a, a critically important point that it, it's it's uh, uh, we are not the right audience. We're already sold, or we wouldn't be here this afternoon. It's the audience that's not here that needs to be uh, uh, needs to be persuaded. So, what does a piece of research do to help deliver the better outcomes that are implicit in that map? I think that's that's kind of, uh, of how you you take this and and leverage it, and you know maybe you know spend that ten cents on the dollar uh, uh, to 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 promote the value of the research as much as the research promotes the value of the art. Just remember that's our 10 cents they're spending, so we just gotta be, make so, sure we're really, we have to give them an extra with, 10 cents. Do it with nine cents. <laughs> <laughs> yes, please. Hi, Christopher Morgan. Um, I'm an uh, artist in residence here at AU and also a choreographer in my own right. And I'm really in, interested in the ambiguity of this structure, that there is a room, that there is a space for a lot of different types of art to fit in it. And then I was really motivated by what you asked about, well, where might things that don't fit in this go? And to go to your question, Mr. Taylor, about what might the next steps be, perhaps this is a great tool for those of us that are arts administrators or artists to bridge to those that don't fit into these models. Mm -hmm. Through this work, we are educating audiences and each other, and those that don't fit in then become a beneficiary of this work without even having to fit themselves into it, perhaps. And I'm also very curious then about the next steps as a field, as many fields, but particularly in dance, the structures that have existed so far are really um, in disrepair. The 501c3 non-for-profit model is very much broken for many of us. And I think this is alluding to, and I'm very optimistic about it, ways to start bridging to those artists and those that don't fit into this particular construct. And I'm curious where the NEA sees future bridges for that coming down the road. Um, it's a big, huge question, I understand, but I think it's something that a lot of us, you mentioned work with the Duke Charitable Trust, I think they're one of the ones that's doing great work in that front, but I'm curious where that is the next step for many of us. That's great. Thank you. Go ahead. Uh, my name's Anjali. I'm a student here. Um, one thing I, again, what comes next, I feel like something we're not really talking about is the human impulse to create and express. It's like a given, which for us, it is a given. But I think arguing to the population that it exists in everybody, I think you'd find a lot of people who are not in the arts who would disagree with the statement. And I think that's research that would need to happen next or now. Great. Thank you so much. It, may I comment yeah, on that? Um, a great point. People can define themselves into this map or out of the map, um, but, but it, to say it, so, so an individual can decide that they have no creative instinct, no curiosity. Um, I think part of our responsibility as institutions, speaking from an institutional standpoint, is to try to find ways in to say, you know what, you are, you are creative, <laughs> come on in. Um, so so that, that's part of our responsibility, I think, on our side, is to invite people in and to provide ways into it. Um, great point. Great, uh, David. And I think that, that part of that comes back again to the language that we use that helps yeah. box people in or out yeah. of their own creativity mm -hmm. and their understanding of creative impulse. Mm -hmm. uh, Janet Brown at Grantmakers in the Arts had a really nice uh, blog post about a month ago about that, if you, you know, sitting down with her family and saying, you know, are you involved with the arts? And you know, they all said no. And then she asked, you know, well, are you, uh, do you sing at church? Yeah. Uh, do you read a book? Uh, do you read a novel? Yeah. And she started, then you get to the specificity of like being engaged or a participant or an engager with art. <clears throat> and then you start moving beyond that into where you do exemplify creativity. My father was a machinist for General Motors and uh, graduated from like the sixth grade and would never himself say that he was an artist. Uh, he would not say himself that he thought of himself as, as, as creative. That said, I watched him essentially build a clock from scratch uh, with you know, figuring out how to cut metal, how to make springs, how to do all this stuff, and he built it. And I would say he's pretty darn creative, uh, but 
he would never put himself in that box, but that creative impulse was in him. And I think, again, for me, that I'm still concerned about the isolation <laughs> of the bubble on the top and about uh, how, we, how we kind of think, and we assume that that will be protected forever. Uh, and I'm not sure it's fully protected. I know it's survived through horrific things. Uh, but that said, I, I still think that we make decisions that could help it or harm it. I, I feel the opposite about the map. I think it provides, in fact, a way of defining the creativity or mm -hmm. curiosity as central. So, mm -hmm. the, so the negative capability mm -hmm. of that argument of, no, you're not an artist, because you only sing in the church choir, gets taken out of this setting. Um, and I think the map's quite useful then. It has to get reinterpreted in, a, in an easier way for regular human beings. <laughs> right. one, 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 one little tiny last thing, because I think we've all talked a lot about the, the notion of the, the map and it's, you know, how fixed is it? And I think that none of us is using the same world atlas that we used 20 years ago. Mm -hmm. uh, and so the fact of the matter is that this is this map, and this is right now. And we will see the, you know, the bubbles shift and change, and the, and the lines shift and change or go away. But it's a place of starting, and I great. think it's great. Well, I know we're running out of time, so I wanted to end with just four quick slides to maybe frame what we do next, I hope. Uh, one of my favorite quotes from statistician George Box. So all models are wrong, but some are useful. So. <laughs> Here, this, this model had a very curious, it was a utility to the internal workings of the National Endowment for the Art and the Research. They had to say something to the Office of Management and Budget, probably, about a logic model that informed the way they spend our, tax, our taxpayer money. And it already has proven utility, right, for them. We're now talking about stretching that utility into persuasive arguments, into our own work, and that's great. Some of them they are going to fit, some they're not. Um, and the other map, I think we just, um, so, Great. This is just another good way to think of a map. There's yeah. no way that the subway system actually looks like this. Yeah. You know, it's evenly spaced. There's very large circles where you find multiple trains. There's no way that the, the Capitol Mall is that square. Um, but at the, you know, it's not intended to be right. It's intended to be useful if you want to get from one place to another. So the moment you detach the map from its intended use, it gets all squishy. Um, so we can think of new utility for this map, but we can't sort of say, well, you know, it's not useful. It's already useful. How is it useful next? Um, so I guess I would encourage us all to, to think of the utility here and not try and stretch it beyond its intended use, but maybe say, here's a use I might have. Mm -hmm. um, if I were the arts infrastructure, I would think I was the Catholic Church and somebody just put a note on my door <laughs> with this map. Um, <laughs> I am, I'm a little concerned. <laughs> Because if I were the arts infrastructure, I would draw the circle around. You can't get to the yellow sun unless you come through me. Um, and here it is off on the side. So you're, 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 about, 80, you're about 85 uh, nodes short. That's right. So there's some really interesting questions, the little hop that the impulse has to make to get into the system. These are all fabulous stuff. I would encourage you to think about the utility of the map, if it's useful to you, where it's useful to you, where it is not useful, which is also interesting. And I hope we bring that into the conversation. Um, and I guess the final slide is a thank you to our extraordinary <laughs> presenters and panelists. Let's please thank them. <clears throat> um, I have to um, <clears throat> thanks and a very uh, special thank to the National Endowment for the Arts team uh, at all levels. They bring extraordinary courage to say, you know, have a conversation about this and it doesn't have to be yay, isn't it awesome. It's let's actually put this thing through some, some numbers. Fantastic. Uh, the American University, my new family here, extraordinary at every level. The faculty, the support staff, both here in the NEA, uh, quietly making this seem seamless uh, when it's actually extraordinary complex. And of course to you in this room and online for joining this conversation. Um, I hope it's the beginning of many to come. So thank you all very much. Thank you.